Sure does. All right. Morning. I'm John Travis in Novato, California, on the 2nd of September, 2020, talking to Jeff Anderson, uh, who's also in Novato. I just found out uh, probably shouting distance, <laughs> but we're uh, sheltering in place and uh, in the middle of the, or uh, I hope the tail end of the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, I met Jeff back in 75 when I was shopping for a place to start my wellness center. And you and Milt Estes had your office down there on Miller Avenue upstairs. Right. And um, we uh, talked about it. And then I had this great opportunity of uh, Bob uh, Anderson's um, renovated building with the hot tub and so forth. I just made the connection with both Andersons. I never was <laughs> So that was, uh, what, 45 years ago. And uh, we haven't seen much, each, well, saw a little of each other in the five years I was running the center. Right. I want to uh, start at the beginning of what led you into a different path of medicine, <laughs> uh, where you were born, um, what uh, growing up siblings, uh, what your parents did, what influenced you to A, go into medicine and B, uh, go into a holistic form. So let's start with where and when. Well, I was born and raised in North West Indiana, uh, about an hour from Chicago. It's a little oh. small town in the, right the north uh, west corner, uh, just a few miles from the tip of Lake Michigan. Um, and it was uh, a nice, small, very, uh, you know, middle America town. Very, it was very uh, conservative, uh, as you probably would imagine. Yeah, northwestern Ohio for me. Yeah, uh, it was a pretty Republican town, I would yeah. say, almost, uh, except for a few blue collar people. Um, uh, but I, it was a great place to grow up. I, I have great memories of uh, great, I love that part of the country ge geographically. It was great to have seasons. Uh, I miss that, actually. I miss the um, I'm glad we don't have winters that require a lot of snow shoveling, but when you're young, it's all good. <laughs> anyway, it was a great place to grow up. Um, I had uh, a, a great experience in high school. I'm really have, I'm still one of my best friends since age eight. And it still lives out in Indiana. I, we see each other a lot. Um, then I... What were your parents, uh, and do you have siblings? What, do you yeah, I have an older brother, four years older. We did not get along. Uh, he was, uh, it was a long story. He was fairly um, abusive. Um, you, you took his place as the center of attention. Yeah, we, there, there were some, some difficult family dynamics that created that. Uh -huh. he, took, he took his, his anger out on me. Um, but anyway, that all got worked out eventually. Um, my father was a, a executive of a large corporation um, in the area, Bering Corporation. He worked his way up from, you know, just before World War One, as a accountant in the company and worked up his way to CEO and uh, chairman of the board eventually. Uh, very successful. Very, he was also a very conservative Republican, and he um, was a state senator, uh, Indiana state senator, uh, for a while. And was thinking about making a run, run for the governorship. He probably would have won, but he decided he didn't want to do that. I think he loved his business too much. Anyway, um, my mother was fantastic. She was an artist. Uh, she was a, a, a musician, um, a great home, homemaker, and a fantastic, fantastic cook. Um, so it, all in all, other than my, my, my uh, slightly crazy brother, um, uh, which I could say we're, we're good friends now and it's all, it's all, uh, you know, water under the dam. Um, I, I had a good childhood and so then I went to, I was kind of a rebel, probably as a reaction to my brother. Um, and they got into some trouble in high school. I was, um, did some sports, uh, was in music. I was also very mu musical. What'd you play? Uh, I played a lot of things. I played uh, piano and um, trumpet and uh, eventually French horn. 
Oh. I was a singer, so singing was one of my, my primary things. My mother was a choir choir director of a big, huge church, multiple choirs. So I got to sing in choir since I was like four or five years old. Um, so that was all good. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, I, I, I loved, you know, liberal arts. I loved music, but I also liked science. So I decided, and I loved animals. I worked on a dairy farm for a couple of summers. A friend of mine who owned a big, family owned a big dairy farm. So I said, well, I think I want to be a veterinarian. So I went to Purdue University and got into the pre-vet program. And I got into a badass fraternity. Uh, a, a, a fraternity that if you ever saw the, the uh, is, this, is it the um, Lampoon movie? The Animal House? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was the Animal House of Purdue. And it was a very dysfunctional. Um, a lot of raucous parties and penny raids and uh, probation. And, um, and I got sucked into it and uh, ended up flunking out. They say my sophomore year. And I didn't like the curriculum. Um, a lot of rinky dink courses that I already knew. Because my, my, my family background, both sides, mothers and fathers, until, until their generation, were all farmers. So I grew up visiting lots of relatives' farms. I, I knew a lot about that stuff. And so I didn't want to need to go to college and learn egg handling, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I got caught up with this dysfunctional fraternity and I just ended up cutting classes and screwing up. And I, I flunked out and I worked a semester in construction and kind of got my head uh, straightened out, went back, got readmitted on probation, decided, well, I really just don't want to be a veterinarian. Um, so I decided to go into pre-med. And that's what I did. And although I fell in love with the, the philosophy department and a couple of professors and the um, social psychology department and worked under a couple of professors, they liked me a lot. They wanted me to go in and do PhDs with both of them. And so I had to make a big choice between, do I want to take that path, go into an academic world, or do I want to be a doctor? Um, I think family pressures probably had some significant um, uh, effect on me. My, my father was not particularly interested in having one of his kids be either a musician or, or a college professor. He was thinking, you know, law, medicine, or business. <laughs> I didn't say you had, you know, but anyway, I got, you got the I, message. I got the message. I thought, well, I like science. I like people. So yeah, medicine. So I, when I went back in, um, I actually did very well. I, I graduated high in my class and got um, a couple of choices in medical schools, but I decided to go to Indiana University because it was uh, um, cheaper. And um, I have friends, a lot of friends at IU in the main campus mm -hmm. um, and some at, at the medical center too. So I, I did my college, my medical school in, in Indianapolis, Indiana University. Um, then I, you know, in your junior, I don't know, different medical schools have different, I think we were on the, um, we were on the quarter system, I believe. So anyway, you had one quarter in your junior and senior year where you could go and do externships or clinical clerkships wherever you wanted. Um, cause it, it, in Indiana, at least the junior and senior year were all about clinics, all about you know, you were done with the didactic material, except for a couple of maybe other things, but mostly you were you were evaluating and treating patients and doing you know research. So, I um, my junior year, a couple of the upperclassmen, class ahead of me, and I was thinking, where do I want to go? You know, a couple of the older guys who I knew well said they just come back from their year their, their uh, externship, and they said, San Francisco, 
you got to go to San Francisco. Yeah. It's like the Mecca. You know, it, it, it's like it will blow your mind. And I had already, one of my classmates in Indiana was a fairly progressive guy. And we had already, I've already been kind of gotten exposed to some um, consciousness expanding medicines um, and was kind of already interested in that world. Uh, but anyway, I, I got an externship at, at the Southern Pacific Hospital at that, in those years, it was called Southern Pacific Hospital on the Panhandle in San, in, uh, San Francisco on Fallon Baker Street. And um, I landed, no, actually the first, my junior year, I was at French Hospital. Oh yeah, French. And, and which is no, no longer exists, oh, yeah. taken over by Kaiser. So I got an extraship at, at French Hospital and their internal quarters, their external quarters, their people could stay was in the Haight-Ashbury. Oh, so wow. in June, I landed in 1967 in the Haight-Ashbury. The summer of love was <laughs> just a week after the Monterey uh, festival. I missed that. But I, I got it uh, in on everything else. And it changed my life. I yeah. immediately had that year I, I, I met so many great friends that are still friends, ones that are still alive. And the second year I came out uh, and went to the, the uh, Southern Pacific Hospital that, that year uh, and, and I met my, my future wife. That was in 68. So, um, exciting times. And, and within two weeks of, when I, in 67, within two weeks of landing and getting ensconced in the milieu, I ended up meeting and working for David Smith at the Ed Ashbury Free Clinic. Oh yes, I did it again. After our clinic times, we yeah. would, I would go there and work till often depends late at night with him and his staff, and then um, we would go often go back to his house for dinner, or a late dinner, and um, have a few libations and um, talk about everything that was interesting to talk about in those days, um, and that was a great uh, introduction to the life and. Uh, and the next year, like I say, I came out to the Southern Pacific Hospital and then um, decided to do a straight surgical internship at Southern Pacific. At that, it was renamed Harkness Community Hospital. And I was, I liked surgery. I, I have, was good at it. I did a lot of su surgery in my senior year in medical school. And I thought I wanted to be a surgeon. Uh, okay, sounds good. But I was pretty much in the counterculture, I would say, quite deeply in the counterculture at that point. And I had to work with a lot of senior, you know, faculty surgeons, and I didn't like them. <laughs> they were not much fun. They were very conservative, very straight arrow, um, and I just didn't get along with them. And um, so I, I did one rotation, and I senior with the head radiologist and he liked my work he said you're really good at it you're natural you should apply to a radiology residency at UCSF and because I, I by that time I'm not, not going to do surgery I said well what the hell I, what, I don't know what else to do I'll go for it I got the residency and it was it was the top residency in the country on radiology. It still is one of the top. Mm. So I got in the residency and we, I lasted six weeks. And I realized I don't want to spend my life reading films in this dark room. <laughs> yeah. And that was before, before interventional radiology really took off. So I, you know, it's, there were no procedures to do. It was like, okay, you're reading films pretty much. Uh -huh. so I said, no. Don't want to do that. So I walked into the head of radiology, it's Margolis at the time, very renowned guy, nationally, internationally. I said, I'm quitting. And he 
threw a fit, said, you can't quit. This is the hardest re resumes you can get. You can't quit. I said, well, I, I am quitting because it's not my thing. Um, and I said, do you have a long waiting list of people waiting to get in? You know, yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Only six weeks into the program, you should put somebody in right away. He didn't like it. I just walked out. And at that point, I didn't know what to do. So I actually ended up working, applying to the San Francisco State College, the student health clinic, and worked there for part of a year. Uh, and then I got, and then I started working for Kaiser um, in staffing emergency rooms uh, in various locations in the Bay Area, which made a lot of commuting. And then I got a job um, with, that was fine, but I, you know, somehow, I've, and I can't remember how I got the invitation, but I got invited to go to um, Fort Miley VA Hospital, which was associated with UCSF. And they had just, this is Vietnam War days, and they had just, Congress had just passed a congressional act uh, to establish ambulatory health care and a pilot program at Fort Miley for returning, you know, for servicing vets. Where's Fort Miley? I've never heard of it. Fort Miley is the big, big um, VA hospital complex at the top of, uh, way at the end of, close to Land's End in San Francisco. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're at the, almost at the very end of Gary Street, but it's a few streets over. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took a, I did a job interview. I liked the people. Um, and there was another guy that would to be with me, which I really liked. And so we were hired and we, um, there was a guy over our head, a faculty guy, but we basically ran the emergency room, the admitting department, uh, and the ambulatory healthcare clinic for over a year. And it was a great experience. But at the end of that period, they said, okay, we want now, we want to expand the program and we're going to shift it over to UCSF. And UCSF is going to have their own ambulatory health care department. We want you to be on the faculty. We want you to go in and, and, and run it. And which would mean an academic appointment. And I wasn't board certified in anything. So it was like, well, wow, you know, this is weird. But I, I, my, my experience at the Veterans Hospital, although it was wonderful learning experience, there was a lot of academic and political red tape that I did not like. And I was not, I was pretty averse to stringent academic, you know, policy and the political aspects that go with it. And I didn't think I'd fit in, which you probably wouldn't, I would probably be a good, a good guess. Mm -hmm. So I just said, okay, I'm not gonna do that. What am I gonna do? Well, I actually went back I just bought a house in Larkspur with my wife in Baltimore Canyon at that time. And I said, okay, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to practice out of my living room. I'm just going to just say, I'm going to be open a family practice. Now, how'd you avoid Vietnam at that point? Oh, well, that's another story. <laughs> All right. So when I was, um, I guess when I was a intern, yeah, surgical intern, I um, got the notice report for an exam at the Oakland Induction Center. I was, I was being drafted mm -hmm. as a physician. And I said, I was pretty much a very counterculture hippie at that time. And I was not, um, I was deadly against the Vietnam War, absolutely deadly against it. I said, well, if I, if I can't get out of this, I'm going to move to Canada. I take my wife and we're going to move to Canada. I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. I had already heard of a couple of people in my medical school class ahead of me that were killed uh, in mass units that got bombed. And so I said, you know, I'm not putting my life on the line for this. It's not World War II. So then, through the grapevine, there was. Some, uh, 
uh, word that if you went to this psychiatrist at Stanford, I can't even think of his name anymore. He was, he was in the faculty. He was obviously progressive, anti-war guy. And you went and you paid him a hundred bucks or 150 bucks, whatever. Uh, he would write you a letter saying you were um, psychologically, psychiatrically unfit for duty. Well, I went and paid him and, you know, talked about my abusive brother and, you know, my alcohol and drug uh, experimentation and my depression and all, you know, he, he, he of course vetted most of it um, and, and sent it off. And then a few months later, I got the induction result. So I reported to the place in Oakland and I kind of knew what was going to happen. It's a little embarrassing, but anyway, I'm going to tell it. Um, so, um, so I got myself pretty funky, you know, I didn't shave for a day while well, I had a big <laughs> bum here. I, you know, dressed in funky clothes and I took a, but uh, three or four beers with me in the car <laughs> and, and a tab of acid. And so I went to the induction center, I went to the induction and I was as obnoxious as I possibly could be. I mean, I was just nasty. And the doctor would line these people, you know, you, you've probably been through this. They line guys up. The doctor would stand about six feet away from the line with a little uh, ophthalmoscope. He would go along as if you were going to be able to look at your eye, your fundus. And as he was doing that, I said, are you a real doctor? He said, of course. I said, this is a joke. This is a joke. This is ridiculous. You're, you're, not, you're not making any kind of reasonable exam. You, 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 should, you should be ashamed of yourself. I mean, that was just really, really nasty. I pissed a lot of people off. Finally, at the end, um, I was clearly, you know, persona non grata. And so I got call, called into the commandant's office. And he said, hmm, you really made a you really piss a lot of people off. You know, I, 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 it's the worst I've ever seen. I said, uh, <laughs> he said, anyway, I've got this letter. You're supposed to report to Letterman Hospital uh, in two hours for um, an interview with the psychiatrist over there. So, ah, I knew that's where the letter that the guy at Stanford had landed. So I got in my car, drank a couple beers, took a tab of acid, when I got to the letterman, I went in with the guy and acted as about as dysfunctional as you could be. And he spent about 15, 20 minutes with me and he said, this is a big risk I took, by the way. He said, um, I can't believe you're, you actually have an MD degree and you're actually a licensed physician. You <laughs> <laughs> of Indiana and California. I said, yeah, I am. He said, Are you, and you're still working. I said, yeah. He said, it's, 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 that's, it's travesty. But he said, I'm, you know, it's not my, it, it, it's not on our purview to report you to the medical board. That's not what we do. That's not my business. You're just not, you're just, you're definitely unfit for military service. And gave me a 4F. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the end of that. And I thought, well, you know, the worst thing could happen. It'll be on my record. If I ever want to run for public office, a political office, that would come back to haunt me. Otherwise, probably not much to worry about. Yeah. And, and that was the end of it. Um, and then I, um, I said, I went on and practiced. And then about my second year working out of my house, um, and I was starting to get quite a few patients on it. By that time, I hooked up with Michael Rosenbaum, and this would have been 71, two, a number of people. And then, and then uh, a great herbalist, Rob Menzies, who, wrote, who uh, ran, remember, Star Herbs Company in Mill Valley? Yeah. And he was a great herbalist, and he, I started studying herbology with him. And, got, and started introducing herbs into my practice, her, herbal medicine. And then I got into nutritional medicine with Michael and a few other people. 
and took a lot of courses and had worked with, um, you know, a lot of the big in seminars, the big names in nutritional medicine. And started being integrated at that point. I would say that's when I started getting really integrated. And then um, about 73, 70, wait, 72, 73, um, one of my patients was pregnant. And she said, and I was doing kind of doing prenatal checkups. And she said, would you be willing to, would you be considered doing a home birth? I said, well, yeah, I haven't done any obstetrics since medical school. That wasn't part of the straight surgical internship. No. Uh, and I, she said, uh, she's very healthy. And I said, well, I don't know. Let me think about it. And I thought about it. And, she, and I really liked the people. So I said, okay, you know what? I've got my obstetric textbook. Um, I can go to the library. I'm going to read up on it. I, I, you know, I will promise if everything goes perfectly well, I will help you deliver your baby at home. If one, one little teeny sign that something's not right, you're going to the hospital and I'm out of it. Okay. Um, that went very successfully. And then just the, you know, the word got out and by 74, 75, it was just me and Milton and I think um, the two guys out in Point Reyes that were doing home births. Who's that? Uh, Wit and Witty. Um, I forget their first names. Dr. Wit and Dr. Witty. Never heard of them. Huh. Yeah, they, they were out in Point, they were out in, uh, Point Reyes and did a lot of West Marin home births. And actually, one of their midwives started, started working for me. And ultimately, we had four midwives working for us. And we were delivering babies right and left. Um, and it was, it was a great, and I was doing all the prenatal care and postnatal care. And, and these are home births? Uh, home births. I mean, about, I'd say of all the years we did, I think maybe six or seven people, by that time I had gotten privileges at both Ross General Hospital and Marin General and Children's in San Francisco. Uh, there were maybe 10 hospital births. A few of them were, were um, voluntary. They didn't want to do home birth. And a, a number of them were failed labor, you know, That's labor, you know, prolonged labor. Um, and um, but except for one case, everything went well. Never had any complications or problems. Uh, and then um, I still did a lot of, I studied acupuncture with a guy, a very well-known acupuncturist in the city. Started, I believe in 73 or four, like two or three evenings a week after I studied with him. And I didn't did it in LA, LA licensed acupuncture. I didn't need to because an MD you can do acupuncture. I started doing acupuncture as part of my practice with other integrated stuff and at that point everything was great. I, I love the, my practice but the home births were the most pleasurable part of it because it was just you know what could be what could be better than a, seeing a baby deliver, being involved with delivering babies and and healthy people and having a party afterwards. So in a great environment. Yeah, and crazy, great, great environments. So a few dicey things that we're out to a hospital way out in South Toledo. Um, a woman who was in arrested labor had to put her in the hospital, roll her back to shore, put her in the car and take her to the hospital. Um, so there were a few challenges. Uh, logistics. Rode her from a houseboat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a story. So so let's see. So about 1978, um, my, but my daughter was born in 76, my one child. My marriage had suffered from being a workaholic. And my wife was not a career person. She was a mom and housewife. And uh, although she had been an x-ray technician, she was not 
she, she they want to work. Um, she, anyway, there were there were stresses in our marriage that were starting to mount. And having a child uh, quadruples. And, and I was gone all the time. I mean, we would sometimes it'd be three women in labor in 24 hours. I'd be gone the whole 24 hours and come home, uh, get a few hours of rest, and have to go back. So I mean, it was like I was not that I was not home a lot, mm -hmm. and, and she had all the brunt of everything. So I anyway, it got to the point where I could see the writing on the wall, and I. I decided, and, and, and Milton wanted to go on um, his own, and I sure didn't want to do this practice on my, my own. Um, so I stopped. By that time, Michael Rosenbaum and I had gotten real close, we had been close for years. He had gotten involved with the uh, American Academy of Environmental Medicine, um, probably in 76 or 77. So he convinced me I should go to a meeting, and I did. I forget where it was. Maybe it was in Colorado at Colorado Springs. Anyway, I went to the first my first AAM, uh, AAM, AAM scientific meeting, and was absolutely, you know, mesmerized by it. This is this was amazing. This is amazing paradigm, environmental medicine. I went, you know. In those days, way back then, it was called clinical ecology. Uh, and I just said, well, this is what I want to do. Uh, I, I want to go into that in more depth, but I, I forgot to ask, how did you and Milton meet up? Uh, he suddenly showed up. I was doing home births. I said, I, I need a partner. I'm getting too many patients. Um, so I put out, and I can't remember how I, Advertise, but I put out something on some site looking for a partner that uh, was savvy in obstetrics and we're going to be doing home births, which was a big movement by that yeah. time. And actually, one the first guy that interviewed was Steve Berg, who turned out to be a major uh, OBGYN practice in Marin, a conventional practice. He thought he might want to do it, but then he got cold feet and decided that it was a little too controversial for him. So he went on private practice. And the second person to interview was Milton. And he was definitely interested. And we had a good connection. And so that's, that's how we saw it. Was he already in Marin or the Bay Area? Or? Yeah, he was. And I can't remember what he was doing or where, yeah, what he was doing at the time. It's all very vague. But he was looking for something else. Uh -huh. And um, and so that was it. We, I think we must have joined forces in '75. Well, you already had the office. Uh, I, I visited you the summer of '74, I think. When yeah, I, maybe it was '74 that we got together. I think it was '74. Yeah. And we lasted till '77 or '78, and then um, um, so. And I still have c c contact with him rarely. I, I haven't seen him in, in a year or more. But um, so anyway, that was that was that was my thing, and then I, I took all the scientific meetings and training courses at AAEM, and I, I got board eligible. I never took the boards, unfortunately, I should have. Uh, and that was my practice in uh, allergy, immunology, and environmental medicine, with you know all the same integrated approaches, treatment-wise. Mm -hmm. And including um, uh, new stuff, uh, which would particularly, um, well, pretty much the same. I mean, still nutritional, still herbal, still uh, supplementation. Um, I stopped doing acupuncture after a while because it was too time consuming and there were too many good acupuncturists to refer people to. So, yeah, that that kind of what took over my life, and um, it was great. We uh, it was a very it was a very good association. We started in eighty one. We we moved into a new office building on East Blythdale together, and then in eighty five we moved our practice to Corte Madeira, 
And I think in 80, no, I think it's 89 or 90, maybe around that, they, we decided to stay associated, but separate offices, the same building, um, until I got, until I got really, really sick in 95 and had to take a disability leave of absence from my practice. And I, after a year and a half, I knew I wasn't going to be able to come back to it. I couldn't sell it. So I just went on to disability retirement and started, by, let's see, by, the, by 19, oh, by 1998, 99, I was well enough not to work uh, full time at all. And, but I started consulting. Just as a, uh, uh, let's go back to the, the illness. I, I've heard rumors, but I haven't heard it straight from you that it was involved with the, uh, the refinery and the accident yeah. over there. And so, yeah, about 90, 1990, 89 or 90, um, I got, uh, uh, recruited, let's just say, by a, a woman that I had gotten to know at one of the, some of the meetings. Um, she was a registered nurse who had started a organization called the Response Team for the Chemically Injured down in the Central Coast, um, near San Luis Obispo. And we hit it off and um, she said, well, I want, I want to run a clinic to an outpatient clinic and treat environmentally, chemically injured people, environmentally ill people. So I would, I started going down there for a couple, of the, two or three days a month and staff the clinic. And then they, we got a good reputation. And then in, um, I don't know which year it was, but anyway, um, then there were, there's the, the, the um, Hinkley, the Hinkley uh, chromium-6 case came up uh, as a big problem. That was the uh, one that Erin um, Brockovich got involved with and kind of made her famous. So toward the tail end of that, uh, she and her law firm contacted us and we started working with them and started doing some evaluations of, on patients and dealing with some research about, you know, what the the physiology of the of the chemical injury was and and, and worked uh, as a consultant for them and got to know her and the firm. Now for uh, viewers that may not be familiar with it, I'm only dimly from the movie with uh, what's her name? Uh, the, the, what was the uh, the situation? The oh, it was the PG&E and way down in the Southern California had contaminated a huge area of groundwater with, with chromium-6, which is very toxic and carcinogenic. And many, many people were sick. And so finally it got, you know, clearly revealed what was going on. And then uh, Masri and Vidito, which is the law firm that Aaron Brockovich was working with, they took the case and they actually won a huge settlement. And what was the name of the site again? Hinkley. Hinkley. Oh. Hinkley was a little town right in the middle of that, where the PG&E uh, plant was. Wasn't there another one they made a movie about? That was it. I thought it had a different name than Hinkley, huh? No, it was Hinkley. Um, and then, uh, and then a few shortly after that the big railroad uh, derailment on the uh, Union Pacific Railroad up in Shasta where huge amounts of metam sodium and uh, pesticide, insecticide was spilled into the Sacramento River and killed a lot of the, the, the fish and wildlife and, uh, and a lot of people got sick. And so she, they, that, that uh, firm came into that case and we were also hired to work with them on that case. And then in 94, 
uh, the big unicameral oil refinery in, in um, Rodeo, across in Contra Costa County, they had this huge rupture of a massive catalyst line and were spewing metric tons of this very toxic catalyst that was carried by this plume all the way east to as far as Bellina, as far as um, Venetia. And thousands of people were sick. And so uh, we were called in to the Contra Con Con Costa County Board of Supervisors uh, with UNICAL agreed to have an independent investigation. UNICAL said, oh, it, it's over. We've shut off the catalyst. It's all, it's all good. Our environmental yeah. hygiene is signed off on it. Everything's fine. But people can even get sick. So we said, no, it's not okay. So we, they were forced to, to um, fund a clinic that we opened in downtown Crockett, which is very close to the refinery. Mm -hmm. And we were called in, the response team for the chemical engineer. So I was the head of this staff. Michael and I were kind of the co-heads and a lot of good doctors uh, were part of our team. A lot of nurses and technicians. We opened this clinic and we were probably there. And I was still running my private practice. We were probably there two or three days a week for a long time. Uh, it was difficult. Um, and that's when, um, and Masri and Vitito uh, came in. In fact, they're the ones I think that, that wanted us to, to staff that because they had already been brought in by individual uh, plaintiffs. And so we worked that clinic, but we opened that, we opened that clinic in January of 95. The spill started in September of 94. And we, the clinic, we opened the stores in, in January and we closed the, the doors uh, in September after doing all work for all those months and um, did a lot of research. I wrote a huge re research summary and requested additional research funds to delve a little more deeply into the pathophysiology and possible treatment strategies and they, and they refused to fund it anymore. But the, there were many law firms involved, but I think Mattering, Mattering Vidito, which is where we basically did our uh, expert testimony with, I think they won $80 million in, in settlement for oh, cold class action of patients. Mm -hmm. But the problem was, as it turns out, while we were doing this, people were still getting sick, and then people in our clinic staff were not staring and not feel very good. So we did, we brought in a whole new team of environmental hygienists and environmental engineers. And they started testing everything. The soil, the, you know, the windows, the siding of houses, um, trees, leaves, uh, cars, surfaces of the car. And they found this stuff was everywhere in the food growing in people's home vegetable gardens and, and, and all kinds of surfaces in the carpets in people's homes. And it turns out that Unical was lying the whole time. They had not stopped the, the release. And so they were busted and it got to be very major like intrigue because when that happened, um, there were actually people being followed. There were people being called with death threats. It was really crazy. Mm. Um, but we prevailed. We shut them down. We was it a rupture that they thought they had, or they said they had? Yeah, they, they, they thought they had, but they had not completely sealed it. And then they were. We found out they were actually releasing other uh, from different sources carbon disulfide, hydrogen sulfide, or captans, and other things were also toxic. So- They're releasing them? Yeah. And so they got really hammered. Um, uh, and I think very soon after that, they had to sell. Because they were, they were, I think they were, 
they were here with so many uh, judgments against them and fines that they, they eventually sold to another refinery. But uh, there were thousands of people that we evaluated, a couple thousand at least, and a lot of them were very sick. And and since you know, following some of them for, for a while, some of them were were died um, of complications. So it was uh, pretty pretty nasty stuff. So so everything was going okay personally. Uh, I went back to my practice. It was back to my back to my practice. And in, 19, in, uh, in November, of November, I started feeling crappy. It's November 95. Uh, fatigue, a lot of fatigue. Uh, and then I got a bad URI. And that turned into pneumonia. And then in December, I got a bad case of herpes zoster shingles. Never had that before. Uh, more fatigue. Started having a lot of cognitive problems. Uh, neurocognitive issues. Yeah. And then uh, in January, another bout of pneumonia. And I got to the point where I literally kind of get out of bed in the morning and call to call the office and work. And then it would see patients and come in, I wouldn't remember anything about them. I'd have to get their charts and review. You know, I could remember why they were there, what they were. And so I realized I was in trouble. So I went to see, um, remember Al Levin, an immunologist? Mm, no. Al Levin was uh, associate prof assistant professor of immunology at UCSF under Hugh Foodberg, who was the head of the department. Um, he was a top notch immunologist. And he was involved with AAM. He would attend all the meetings with us and he was lecturing. I worked at him really well. He was very progressive for an academic. Mm -hmm. And at the Unical, the, the clinic, he was on our board of advisors. So a lot of really other good doctors. So he, he got to know me very well. And when I got that sick in January, I, I called him and said, you know, there's something going on. I uh, can I uh, see you. And, and Lou Brennan was his partner. So they, they, they saw us and um, they saw me and daughter. they said, well, you know, you have all the same symptoms as the patients you were evaluating at Unico. Yeah. You know that, don't you? I said, well, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but maybe there was something else going on. And so they did a complete workup and I had, it was just a uh, horrible, I mean, it's, uh, I scared the shit out of me. I, I scared my French, but my immune system had crashed completely. I, I had immunoglobulin deficiency. I had cell mediated immune deficiency. I had massive positive viral uh, titers and DNA PCRs for Epstein Barr and HHV6 and uh, you know, all kinds of other bad actors and tremendous amount of abnormal, you know, metabolic markers. And um, he said, you gotta take, you gotta go on disability leave. You cannot do this, you can't work. And he said, you're, I warn you that you're, 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 you're gonna be a, a very vulnerable to developing cancer down the line because your immune system is really not in bad shape. Um, my cholesterol had gone from totally normal to sky high. It was all epigenetic damage, mm -hmm. direct uh, chemical and, and epigenetic damage to my, you know, it was, it was a mess. And um, I spent a few years getting well enough to start not working I stayed, I've been on disability ever since actually. Um, but it's 96 or seven, I started working with a few people, like close friends or people in the family, and started consulting with a few people. Uh, and off and on, I've been consulting with people with, you know, chronic illnesses. 
ever since, but only as a consultant, not primary care. And they have to have a primary care physician. And, but I kept my, so I've kept my fingers in the pie. Mm. And, um, and of course, continue to expand my, my I, I think of the last AA meeting, I, I haven't been to one for five or six years. So I've kind of dropped out of that. Um, so it's, it's pretty much just a, you know, hit and miss thing. I, I, sometimes I work with maybe three or four people, um, often chronic fatigue, some cancer patients, a lot of uh, environmental illness people, Lyme disease. Oh yeah, so the, the story keeps going. So uh, even though I was getting slowly better, I had very abnormal brain scans and spec scans and um, one or two abnormal EEGs. And so I was a slow climb, a slow climb back to market function relatively well, well. You yeah. said a spec scan? I don't know what that is. Uh, after a brain scan, you said another scan. Uh, oh, SP, a spec scan, S-P-E-C-T. Uh, it's a, um, it's a nuclear medicine scan. It stands for uh, how is it? Where is it? Oh, um, what body part are they scanning? Brain. It's brain. Oh, it's a brain. Okay. Triple headed scanner. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the. Well, it doesn't matter. I just. I, I, it's I, a, it's a it's it's only been around for oh, 15, 20 years. So anyway, I had all this hard science and findings, but I finally got better enough to be able to function. And then in 2004, um, I got some blood work and the blood work showed I had a positive Lyme test, but I didn't feel like I had any Lyme symptoms. I, I did have some chronic foot pain, which I thought was anatomical and was not very successfully treated with lots of different orthotics and special shoes, but it never went away. And then um, I just lived with it. It was still chemically sensitive. Even to this day, I've still never had chemical sensitivity before that real injury. And um, I have to be very careful with environmental exposures. Then in 2001 or two, I started developing a, a sore throat that would come and go on my right side of my throat. It just felt like um, uh, like a little canker sore or something in my throat. And it would come and go. Uh, I would take a lot of supplements and you know, do a lot of holistic integrative stuff and it would go away for a while and would come back um, I mean, mostly when I would eat something that would hurt. And then I started hurting all the time, constantly. And finally, I went to a couple of ENT guys, one local, and they scoped me, they CT scanned me, they scoped me, and they said, we don't see anything. So I thought, well, I've got all these viruses that are intermittently, if not chronically active, including Epstein-Barr, HHV6 and 7. Um, I think it's just, you know, viral. And I said, well, probably. Uh, but it kept getting more and more persistent. And finally, in 2004, I went to a guy who I refer patients to all the time at CPMC, a, a really great NTN guy, ENT guy. And I said, well, look, they, said, they, they can't find anything, but would you look and see if you could see anything? And he looked at there and he said, well, you've got, you've got a little lesion on the back of your tongue, the base of your tongue. I think it's just a little papilloma, but let's biopsy it just to make sure. And then he biopsied it and he didn't tell me the results. He came in for a follow-up. He did a more thorough exam and he found a node, a big node in my neck, which I hadn't found. He said, well, you, you know, it's cancer. You know, it's famous cell carcinoma. And, uh, you got to deal with it. So basically I interviewed multiple UCSF and CPMC and um, everybody wanted to do radiation and chemotherapy and 
I had a good friend, um, which I think you know, Brian Bouch up in Petaluma. Uh, mm-hmm. Integrated doc up there. Very good one. Uh, I've known him since 77 when we practiced together out at Commonwealth for a while. Uh, um, staffing Commonwealth Clinic for Michael uh, Lerner. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so um, I called him because I knew he had had the same thing a few years before. And I said, okay, well, what do I do? I uh, like what I'm hearing. He said, go to MD Anderson in Houston. That's where I went. And um, they're the best in the country, maybe in the world on head neck cancers. So I went, got evaluated, and they said, you don't need chemo, you just need radiation. We can cure you 99%. Sure, we can cure you with just radiation alone, no chemo. And so I could afford to go down there and live for three, three and a half months, rent a condo and be treated, and I did. And it did work. It yeah. got cancer <laughs> uh, with a lot of l- late sequelae, including a lot of fibrosis in my throat and neck and difficult swallowing. Part From of the, the radiation? Yeah, radiation. There's mm-hmm. 70 gray is a lot of radiation. Yeah. So, but there is a cancer that would be warned me about years earlier. Yeah. Um, and uh, then in 2007, I got in a new relationship, fell in love with this woman who, uh, who had been a, major, a kind of a, a casual, big, somewhat casual friend uh, through a mutual friend of ours. So I um, started getting a relationship with her and it turns out that she, she was living in LA at the time. So it was a long distance relationship. She had moved to LA several years before to, for a job opportunity down there. And so we got a, I got a call one night from her close friend, Michel French, saying she's really sick. Um, what she, what's going on? And she t- told me her symptoms. And I said, you know, what, you know she's nauseated, no, no appetite. She's fatigued. Um, she's, the last few days, she's developed, you know, uh, dark stools and, you know, I mean, light, light color stools and, and, and yellow, uh, dark urine. And, um, I said, get her to the emergency room immediately. This is either a fulminant hepatitis, something really, really bad form of hepatitis, or it's something worse. And I kind of knew intuitively that it was worse. Anyway, she went to the emergency room and within two days she had gotten GI consults and it was pancreatic cancer, stage two. Mm. So, she had a Whipple procedure, and then she moved back up here to, to live with her best girlfriend. And I started working with her as a friend, you know, in a, in a light relationship um, with holistic, you know, oncology uh, strategies. But she was already in, you know, in the full gem side of it chemotherapy protocol, which is the one at the time, which is pretty much choice. And we worked together for a few months. We got closer and closer and closer. And then I realized I'd fallen in love with her. <laughs> and so we started this much deeper relationship. And then about somewhere around February or March of the next year, we would have been uh, 2007, I started getting really agitated and anxious. I couldn't sleep. Um, emotionally labile, I couldn't figure out what's going on. And I woke up on a nightmare when one night she was sleeping next to me. I freaked out. She said, what's going on? I said, I think I know why I'm, I think I know why I'm psychologically 
melt down here. I, I think I'm in, scared to death you're going to die. And, you know, I'm not going to have you in my, in my life. And she, was, she was a wonderful person. She, she, she totally understood. We kind of thought we talked through it. I thought I got a little more grounded. But it just kept getting worse and worse and more and more emotionally labile and, and then depressed. And I thought, this is, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going crazy. So I need to see a psychiatrist. So I've been, I worked with a psychiatrist. And he put me on five or six different antidepressants. None of them, none of them worked. And not all, all at once. They try one, didn't work. Mm -hmm. Bad side effects, or didn't work, or both. Went through the whole bunch of them. Uh, and by the time it rolled around to now, we're in like around June. And I'm so dysfunctional that it's starting to impact her. She's tried to fight for her life and chemotherapy and all these other things. Mm -hmm. She said, I, I can't, you know, we need to take a break in our relationship because, you, you know, you, you, you're making me crazy now. <laughs> so I said, absolutely. So I did. It was hard. Um, and so finally, after, you know, a few more trials, different, and this is a great psychiatrist, by the way. The guy's really good. He said, I don't know, I don't know what to do. I said, well, I'm going to go see a neurologist. He said, that's a good idea. So I went to see a neurologist at CPMC, and he did a full exam. He did, looked at my medical records. He said, well, you know, I had a positive Lyme test in 2004. I said, yeah, but I said, I said, we're going to get you a scan, a brain scan, a spec scan, more labs. And long story short, it came back, you have neuroborreliosis, borreliosis, you have neural Lyme, and it's making you crazy. Mm. And he said, antidepressants are not going to do anything for you. He put me on a massive antibiotic protocol. And by September, I was 85% better psychiatrically. But I started realizing I had more neurological hard signs. Equilibrium, balance, coordination, cognitive impairments, some neuropathies. Um, so, uh, so then I realized I had both Lyme and co-infections, Bartonella, Babesia, uh, and mycoplasma. So then I been on a, a, a long, long journey with Lyme disease, and I still I'm not on that one, but but basically. Psychologically, I, I got grounded and got to be the point where everything was fine. And she and I got back together in September of 2007 and 2008, she moved in and we got married in 2010. Mm. But she died a year later. So we had, we had that much time together, but it was, she was a remarkable, just a remarkable being. Um, so it was probably the most profound relationship in my life, the second one at least. Um, and you know that that was hard. <laughs> yeah. So I'm still grieving grieving that one. Um, but um, she was a real gift. She she was the most graceful person that I've ever seen face of life threatening illness, and still. It was amazing. Mm. Never complained. Never just um, got great equanimity about the whole thing. I mean, she was sad to be leaving, but you know. Yeah. But anyway, so that was uh, that's kind of um, that was will be ten years in next May that she died. So you know, um, I've. Now a single guy, and um, doing what everybody else is doing, sheltering in place and um, keeping my fingers in my pie. But yeah, I'd like to um, 
uh, talk about that but uh, also in more uh, detail. But going back to the 70s, just because you and I were there in the, the glory days of Mill Valley. And <laughs> were. That was the epicenter, wasn't it? Yeah, I, Tom Ferguson had this famous quote of throw a dead cat over your shoulder in Mill Valley and you're likely to hit a holistic center or something like That's that. That's right. Yes, that was the time of, of what's her name, Sarah McFadden and the, uh, oh, the, the cereal, yeah. Cereal, and that was the time of WHN, which was uh, right. Sheamus and Rosenbaum and uh, Kozlenko and a bunch of other people. And it just, you know, it was me and you and. Um, Oh gosh, it was zero. It was yeah, uh, uh, Peter Pick and Steve Pick. Uh, down there. And then uh, you mentioned acupuncturist. The only one I knew of was Hal Balin over on the houseboat. Yeah, Hal Balin. Uh, yeah, most days, I think was, he was pretty much the one in Marin. In those yeah. Days. A lot of them now. Um, Marty had, uh, I don't know if he'd taken Marty up. Marty Marty, right? Was he still over in Stinson Beach, or uh, when did he come back over? I don't there? remember, but he was in Mill Valley pretty early on. Yeah, and who else was there? Uh, you you mentioned this guy in Petaluma I'd never heard of. That's Brian Bouch. Well, he was never. He was always in Petaluma. Yeah, I. Um, came to Marin. There was another guy in Petaluma, the nutrition guy. Uh, what's his name? Um, he's now in the Southwest now. Uh, who else? Uh, oh, Gabriel Cousin. Yeah, yeah, Gabriel Cousins. Gabriel Cousins, right. Yes, uh, that's right. Wow, I forgot about him. And, uh, and Jerry Jampolsky uh, invited me out for lunch and started telling me about his ideas. And I thought, oh, wacky, this will never fly. <laughs> I forgot to do healing, right? Yeah, wow, did he take off? Yeah, he and Diane, uh, I was very involved. I was on an advisory board, I think, way back early in the 70s. Uh -huh. One of my best friends, Tom Pinkson was one of the top people in, in, in the staff. So oh yeah, Tom, he's on my list to interview. Uh, yeah, he's one of my, he's probably my oldest best friend. Um, really? We've been best friends for 48 years. Did a lot of medicine work together, a lot of journey work together. Um, and then you, you mentioned Michael Lerner and Commonweal. I didn't realize they had a clinic out there. You were going- Yeah, when he started in 77, he said, well, I want to open a clinic. I think we put, but, but, in that time, the focus, that was before he was developed the cancer program. Uh -huh. That time was more environmental, uh, with his brother Stephen was doing a lot of environmental research, environmental health research. So, um, so he said, I want to open a clinic. And so he hired me and Brian, and Brian's wife uh, was a registered nurse, uh, and we would, go out and I, I, I can't remember how often, but we either a couple days a month, uh, maybe maybe a couple of days every two weeks. Uh, and we'd see a lot of patients out there. I got to know a lot of incredible people. Um, I got to know, you know, um, Alan Watts' kids really well. And uh, never had to meet Alan, but I, I, we had a lot of mutual friends. Was Ann Watts one of the kids? Uh, it was, uh, what was her name? It was a long time. Uh, the Ann Watts I know from the Human Awareness Institute was... And I, it wasn't, it, it, there were two of them. Um, God, I can't remember her name. Joanna, jo Joan, Joan, Joan was his da older daughter. And she was, I can't remember her married name now, was married to Tim. And they, they were heavily involved in the Commonwealth. Anyway, um, yeah, and, and that, Clinic lasted only a few years, as far as a clinic where people could come and mm -hmm. be treated. And then he kind of shifted into the cancer program. Yeah, I remember the founding meeting of that going out there, and I had a bunch of us to introduce his ideas to. And and then uh, um, Elson uh, was out there somewhere. I interviewed him a couple of weeks ago, but. Yeah, what, what, yeah, he, he started the, the preventative medicine place. Well, before uh, that, he was with uh, Mike Samuels in Bolinas. That's right. He was in Bolinas with Mike Samuels, exactly. I tracked him right. down. He lived in Bolinas for years, right. He's yeah. not Sebastopol, but yes. I, I remember, 
and, and Bethany, Bethany was a, was his partner, I think, in those those days. Bethany uh, Argo. Nancy, Nancy uh, Samuels. Right. Yeah, and uh, what a time it was. What a time it was. <laughs> uh, just, it was a real, it was a real uh, revolution. And uh, we, I think Marin County was maybe even nationally kind of the epicenter. I, 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 there were lots of people going, a lot of going on in LA at the same time, I think. Yeah, there was, I kept hearing about Dave Bressler down in LA with the pain clinic. And then uh, other big names at the time were the, uh, what's his name, the, the cancer guy and his wife, uh, Carl Simonton and- Jen, the cancer guy, who was a radiologist. By and then, especially, um, and, uh, and there was uh, Yanoff, Yanoff, the, the the scream, you know, the, the primal uh, scream, primal yeah. scream therapy uh, guy. So California was kind of a epicenter for the whole state, really. Someone said, yeah, the, the primal. Pe I mean, the um, rebirthers uh, Rebirther. over in San Francisco. We had uh, one of them in our office building in, in Miller Avenue. Uh, I remember we did. I did a couple of. Uh, sessions with the rebirthing place over in, really over right on uh, Fell Street. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in San Francisco, way back, way back in the, oh gosh, in the 70s, yeah. Yeah, and they had a big redwood tub in the basement somewhere, yep. yeah. Yep, yep, got, got into a little trouble. <laughs> but the beautiful, beautiful woman was, was the facilitator, and my wife was there, and this woman ended up hitting on me. <laughs> oh. It was a very vulnerable time, and that caused a, a little bit of a, of a yeah. issue in my, my 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 marriage because it was it was uh, I, I didn't bite on it, but um, I was thinking about it, <laughs> and I realized later that, that was totally not uh, that was just not a, uh, ethical. No. Now, and and you have a daughter. Yeah, I have a daughter uh, who just turned 44 on Sunday, and she's um, an only child. Um, her mother and I, like I said she, her mother lives right close to you. We're still really close friends, very close friends. We and we co-manage her life because she um, is disabled. She had a pretty normal. Childhood, she's a beautiful child. And uh, when she was 12, 10 or 11 or 12, she started acting out in various ways, became very contrary, very um, rebellious, you know, drugs and, and, and alcohol and a suicide attempt. And, uh, and we just thought she was emotionally disturbed. And we had her in, and by the time she was about 12, yeah, 12 on, we had her in multiple treatment, residential treatment programs in Oregon and in Utah and yeah, East Bay and the city and uh, all failed. And it was horrible. And finally, we had her up in Oregon. The final place was in Oregon which was the most renowned of all of them. And she ran away. And we had to drive up and they found her. She was on the road trying to hitchhike out of there. And we found her, we went and picked her up. And then when I walked in and saw her, they, they brought her back and she had this wild look in her eye. I said, you know what? I think you're seizing. I think you've got, I think, you, I, I think I told my wife, I think she's having limbic seizures. This is, this is not just psychological. So we put her in the car, we drove her back. And at that time I was working and referring a lot of patients with the uh, UCSF neurologist Silverman, Ike Silverman, remember Ike? No. Isaac Silverman, well he's, he was the, one of the great neurologists, uh, the old, the old school neurologist, just really brilliant and intuitive and, uh, and very, very open-minded, a very, very, a very uh, progressive uh, a neurologist. 
And I call him, I said, I told him what's happening. I, I, there's something going on. I think she's having seizures. Would you work her up, do some EEGs and um, scans? Because she's been treated over and over and over with psychiatrists, one psychiatric drug after another, after another, and it's just not happening. I said, sure, bring her in. Next day we brought her in, EEG scan, called me the, at night and said, Bad news, she's got a tumor in her brain. Mm. Oh, a brain tumor. So the, right in the, in the brain stem, close to the thalamus, so it's, it's no wonder she's acting crazy. He said, get her to UC. So I call, I happened to also, uh, and those was because I had a lot of patients that I referred to Charlie Wilson, the chief of neurosurgery surgery at UCSF, the renowned, Charles Wilson, um, I called him, I said, Dr. Wilson, Charlie, I could, he said, oh, bring her in tomorrow. She brought her in to his office and with him were the, the, co, the, the, the co heads of the co chairman of the pediatric neurosurgery department. And he, we talked, he was a very kind man. He, was just, he said, you know, I don't do adults. He was, a, he was a, the, the greatest uh, brain tumor neurosurgeon in the world at that time. He said, I don't do adults, but these guys are fantastic. So I'm gonna put her in, your, in their hands. And they admitted her, they, in two days they had a plan and they did a stereotactic surgery to get a biopsy. They couldn't, they couldn't excise the tumor. But they got a good biopsy and then they, it was a great, two, three glioma. And they said, well, can't get out of surgery, but it should respond well to radiation. So she had, um, and there was a lot of damage. There was also a lot of shift. Hydrocephalus had already started developing. And um, they said, but we'll do it. And so they did the very early form of uh, fractionated radiation, the guy with the Dama knife, Dama knife kind of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it did, it worked, it destroyed the tumor. But she then, the hydrocephalus progressed and she had to have shunts put in and shunts failed there, had to be revised multiple times and she had tremendous amounts of side effects. Um, and she then got the worst case of mono, I think when she was 16 or 17, and that turned into a chronic recurrent Viral ME, uh, Epstein Barr, uh, which is still to this day is still fighting. And her immune system really took a beating, I think, with all the radiation and all that. So she's disabled. She's been on Social Security, Disability, and Medicare since she was 18. Um, was able, when she was younger, was able to go to college for a year, then went to vet tech school for almost three years, almost made it through and then get compensated. She was able to work some jobs. Elsa. Now she can't work anymore. So we manage her life and we're, we're trying to, we're supporting her. And she's got really bright, she's very bright. She's got the high IQ, but um, tremendous amount of neurocognitive impairment and a, a lot of uh, executive functioning impairment. So she's, she can't really manage her life. She, she's socially pretty functional, um, le very loving, very intuitive soul. So anyway, um, it's been, that's been a, a, another um, challenge in our life. Yeah, well, it's too bad. Yeah. So we've had an interesting run. Um, I would say I don't regret anything. Well, I regret that. Yeah. What happened to her? I regret losing my second wife. Um, and the health struggles that you've been through with the. Uh, lots of health struggles. And, uh, totally healthy until that chemical injury. Corporal, corporate malfeasance. And, uh, you know. yeah, I mean, I was. I was flying airplanes and skiing like crazy and scuba diving and rock climbing and 
um, I, I was in good shape going to the gym. I was 170 pounds and in really great shape, and now I'm 125 and well, lousy <laughs> shape because I can't work out anymore. I have a bad back now. So yeah, I've been, I've had some karmic issues with my health. <laughs> I guess I'd say. Well, uh, historically, I I feel like I've um, drained you pretty pretty dry. Uh, I'm curious what your take on the current situation is with uh, COVID the lockdown and uh, the uh, promise of a vaccine that will return us to normal and uh, other fantasies. I have very very ambivalent feelings about it. Um, number one. If we had a leader like FDR was in 80 years ago um, or so, instead of the man we've got in the White House now, who was a true leader and really know how to make things happen like FDR did, and a, not the same, but a very similar kind of crisis, the Great Depression, and then World War II. Um, Knowing what I know, and I'm sure you are hearing this from your, from your own experience and many others, and it was months before they, anybody was starting to do this. IV vitamin C, mm -hmm. high doses of zinc, melatonin, uh, and a few other things, boot boosters, including, you know, um, remember stragulus and definitely um, elderberry syrup extract. Um, most people would have either gotten a very mild case or been asymptomatic. And this, this is as a preventative, you know, they would have been mm -hmm. taking these things daily. Not the IV vitamin C, but oral vitamin C. But once they got sick and in an emergency room, if they started giving IV vitamin C mm -hmm. with the adjuncts, most of them would have not ended up in ICU. Uh, but these strict, you know, protocols of you know, basically community standards of practice protocols, or there's not enough evidence to do these things, when they were absolutely working. The Chinese were, said they were working. Uh, in New York, when they got inundated, they were giving people IV vitamin C, and it was working. So if they had done the right things preventatively, and um, instead of spending money on wasting money, if they had subsidized people who couldn't afford it, so these are the things you need, everybody needs to be taking. You know, five grams of vitamin C a day, you know, so many milligrams of the zinc, so many milligrams of divided doses of melatonin and, uh, you know, elderberry syrup and uh, NAC, there's a bunch of, you know, if you can't afford it, we, they're cheap, we will subsidize you. So that hopefully you will, if you get exposed, you will get either an asymptomatic case or a mild case. If you get sick, then there's another level of, of treatment that you can get from your doctor, or if you have to go to the emergency room, that will keep you probably out of harm's way as far as anything serious. Unless you're old and you have a lot of co comorbid conditions, in which case, you know, um, yeah, just like the flu, people die. Mm -hmm. But the more people that get it, who don't get really sick, the more the more herd immunity will will will, will acquire more herd immunity sooner. Um, and that, of course, once that decision was made to not do that and to go the conventional conservative way and go into lockdown and social distancing and that, then, then it's basically over because of once that commitment was made, it's hard to go back. Yeah. Is it because people that are going to be, which is what has been done, is manipulated by fear and anxiety and. Um, no mention of of healthy things that you could do. It's all about fear and. Right. It's about pharmaceutical trying to develop big pharma trying to develop multi million or billion dollar drugs. Yeah. That so far, have not paid off. Yeah. I mean, Remdes fire is the only one that was studied, and it only actually lessens the severity and length of the disease by a few days. 
and there's not a lot of data that supports that it really that much diminished the ultimate mortality rate. Um, where about five months ago, I started researching something which I'm sure you've heard of, methylene blue. And the methylene blue may be the most powerful anti-viral drug that we have available. Mm. And it's cheap and it's very, very low. It's a side effects, very high benefit to risk ratio. Um, and it's been around for 147 years. It was the first drug admitted to the US Pharmacopeia in 1889. Mm. And it was the medical use, it was first used as a dye for fabrics in the textile industry in the 1870s. Uh, that's all the blue jeans were, were dyed with methylene blue because indigo blue was so hard to get and very expensive. So it was a chemical that was synthesized to mimic basically a, a sort of a, a close copy of indigo blue. And then in 18, late 79 maybe, Paul Ehrlich, the, the great, the father of clinical pathology in Germany, said, well, this, is good. this might be a good dye for slides for, you know, histology slides, pathology slides. He was using it, it was fantastic, particularly for neural, neural tissue. And then he started doing some bacterial slides, live bacteria, you know, cover slip, on mm -hmm. stain, little methylene blue. Time I got under the microscope, the organisms were dead. And he kept doing, well, they're just killing these things. <laughs> so maybe it would be a good, Antimicrobial, but particularly malaria. And so, anyway, he discovered it was a part important anti malarial, and it was started being used in the Spanish American War and all the way through World War I and World War II. All the troops got methylene blue. Uh, after you know, it replaced quinine, which was used in the mm -hmm. 19th century. And it was uh, off to the races. And then, as you know, um, somewhere in the 50s or 60s, it became known as the drug of choice for methemoglobinemia because it could totally reverse methemoglobinemia from carbon monoxide poisoning or cyanide poisoning or other toxic um, causes of methemoglobinemia. And it's given IV in emergency rooms all the time. Yeah, that's what Jack Bush has been saying that this- No, I know, it's actually been, yeah, we, I, I, I've been, uh, I haven't actually been like, talked to him personally, but we, I've emailed him and we, we, we're having a little conversation, but he, yeah, he, many, many, it's, it's kind of exploded. A lot of the docs all over the world are using it now. I didn't know that. Oh. Yeah, guy in India found that if you give it by nebul through a nebulizer, pulmonary nebulizer, it reverses the arch picture in 24 to 48 hours. X-rays clear, patient walks out of the hospital. Wow. Um, if you add a little bit of uh, nebulized steroid, it even works faster. Oh. Um, but, uh, so I've been using it um, a lot. A lot of patients are taking it. I'm convinced um, if you want, you can give me your email. I wrote a kind of a monograph about it that uh, I was posting to some, some patients and some family and friends and other people. Basically, as a COVID update, um, uh -huh. this is looking real potent for COVID. I think that if people take a maintenance dose, they would never get the disease. And um, one of the articles that my research was uh, published in March of this year. It was right in the middle of the COVID. In, in, in Italy and France, an uh, oncology group cooperatively treated 2,500 patients, cancer patients who were in, in 
and ongoing chemotherapy for various cancers. And they were treated with methylene blue because of, it's also the drug of choice for treating chemo brain. So the encephalopathy from chemotherapy drugs, it reverses it. Mm -hmm. uh, orally, or if it's severe, you can give it IV. And they were given it orally. And these people were in and out of hospitals and clinics the whole time. And they were definitely exposed to COVID. And there were no vaccines. Um, out of 2,500 patients, not one of them got COVID and not one of them got any virus, no URIs. Mm. And they wrote this article and they said, we looked at all the ways that you can look at it. And I suppose it is, it's possible, nothing is impossible, right? It's possible that it could be a coincidence, but we don't think so. Mm -hmm. And in my experience right now is that um, everybody I have on it, nobody's gotten virus, nobody's gotten COVID. I have got probably 40, 50 patients that I know, or at least I know of that are taking it. Mm. So that's just one tool that could have been used um, pretty early and that would have changed the whole statistic. Yeah. What's going on with COVID? Well, I'm. I'm Looking forward to reading that. Um, I just remembered another historical question I wanted to ask you, and that was the environmental medicine people that are, were, uh, um, I thought I'd turn my phone off. <laughs> um, back in, um, when you first went to that meeting and it uh, grabbed you, I'm trying to remember who started all that. I, I, I was dimly yeah. aware of it. The whole, the whole thing was begun, was started way back in the 50s by um, Theron, Randolph, Theron Randolph. Theron Randolph was a allergy immunology specialist in Chicago who was to be traditionally trained and board certified. And he started seeing in the late 40s and into the 50s a lot of evidence that people had could be hypersensitive allergy to not, not only pollens but also to foods and chemicals. And he started doing this old clinical research and um, digging through the literature, well, I'm sure way back. And he started the Society for Clinical Ecology, I think was in 1950 something. And that was the beginning of what be later became the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. And he was there for a year. I mean, he was going to meetings until he died in his way in his 90s. He was a great old guy, mm. brilliant. Uh, and then Bill Ray uh, in Dallas, Texas, could became the took over that king, you know, sort of the top tier. And uh, you remember Bill Ray? You remember hear about him? No, he wrote all the, the still major textbooks on environmental medicine. Um, I still I still have them all somewhere. Uh, anyway, he. Um, he was a cardiac, cardiovascular surgeon in Dallas, a very well-known cardiovascular surgeon. And um, he's had a huge surgery practice. He got interested and he went to the clinical ecology society and got totally wrapped up, got really close to Randolph. And he opened, at some point, he was still doing surgery, but he opened a whole other clinic, uh, the, what was it called? The Center for Environmental Health, I think, in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And had a really great staff of physicians and technicians and nurses. Um, and he had the only inpatient facility for severely environmentally ill people, the ones that, you know, can't have to live in a bubble almost. And it, had, you know, uh, stainless steel and ceramic chambers to do challenge testing uh, and uh, very sophisticated uh, treatment and evaluation and treatment. And that's what we used to send our really sick patients that were not gonna be able to be treated in, in any successful way as, a, as our patients. Um, and he did it all the way up until he died just two years ago, I think. 
two, two, three years ago. And now, what well, since he died, I think the American Academy has kind of deteriorated a little bit. <clears throat> I'm guessing there'd be overlap with the functional medicine people and- uh, They are, yeah. yeah. There's overlap with ACAM, there's overlap with functional medicine, mm -hmm. um, and A4M, all those, you know, anti-aging. But yeah. uh, unfortunately, they're not getting a lot of new members because the American Academy of Environmental Medicine is still stuck with, they want, they're still involved with promoting intradermal skin testing for allergies, hypersensitivities. So low dose serial dilution endpoint titration of, you know, injectable uh, antigen. And it's, it, it works, but it's very tedious, very expensive. And, um, you know. What's I the alternative? Well, the alternative is a lot of sensitivities can be uh, measured by in vitro testing, um, you know, antibody assays. Uh, and then a lot of the treatment, a lot of it could just be you know, environmental control and avoidance and and, and, and trying to re regulate the immune system with all the functional medicine things. But it, it's, still a, a, it's still a valid thing. It's just a lot of the new docs are not interested in, because it's very expensive. You've got to set up a whole allergy a testing unit in your office uh, and hire, the, you know, Specially trained technicians, um, very expensive yeah. and very expensive antigen, uh, and tedious. Mm -hmm. uh, I should spend hours and hours, and it's just. I think the a lot of the new members have got more enamored of functional medicine, frankly, mm -hmm. and some of the other newer integrated approaches. And I think that um, I think it's the we're not getting a lot of new new blood which I think is an issue. Yeah. Well, and you reminded me of, there's another guy in Mill Valley, Bill Gray, who I'd forgotten. Yeah, about. great homeopath. Yeah, and he's up near Mount Shasta, I think. I haven't tracked him down yet. But yeah, he, he moved around. Uh, I, I knew Bill well. He was actually a patient of mine, and we worked together, and um, he yeah, Was his office in the same building as yours, or I had placed him yeah, somewhere? It was in Mill Valley. I think it was on, uh, over on, uh, on uh, Camino Alto. Uh -huh. But then he, then he moved at some point. Then he moved to Sacramento for a while, and then I heard he moved down to the Central Coast for a while. And now I don't know. I guess you said he's, he's yeah, he's up somewhere uh, towards Mount Shasta. Uh -huh. I met him at a meeting in Florida back in seventy, spring of seventy five, when uh, uh, I was just getting to know the whole alternative medicine type uh, scene. Well, I feel like we've uh, covered. He was, uh, he, was a, he was a great uh, uh, disciple of Atulkus, the, the Greek homeopath, as I remember. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, Roger Morrison, I worked with him also. I've done a great homeopath in, in, in East Bay. Uh, Don't know him. Yeah, Roger Morrison is an MD. He's a, he's a, a board certified in internal medicine, but he got into homeopathy years ago. And I think he's now the probably the most the best homeopathic physician in the Bay Area for most people. Mm. But, um, well, let's wrap up here and uh, yeah, yeah. any sorry, areas we haven't covered. That was uh, all too much information, but anyway. No, I think we've, we've uh, covered the waterfront, unless you've got any final words of wisdom to offer. Well, uh, um, basically, People need to do what their deeper listening guides them to do with, with their health. But I think um, conventional medicine, mainstream allopathic medicine has a lot of limitations. Yes, there has there've been some remarkable breakthroughs and um, even Big Pharma, who I'm not a great fan of, have developed some life-saving drugs, particularly now with cancer immunotherapies, but um, for real, true, long-term 
vibrant health, you really need to be integrated. And mm -hmm. I think that people who don't have access to that, uh, it's unfortunate. And that one of the things that I would love to see change, and the reason that a lot of people don't have access to it, is because of the economics. Yeah. A lot of integrated physicians, by nature, you have to spend much more time with patients, right? To evaluate and treat and monitor them. Um, they can't see 25 patients in a day. Uh, and so they don't charge by, by uh, procedure. Um, it's by time and insurance will only pay a certain small percentage if it's a long, complicated visit. So a lot of people are priced out of it uh, because insurance has not yet opened the door uh, for integrated medicine, which they should have done a long time ago. Yeah. So. Wise words. Well, thank you, Jeff. This has been a delight uh, after 40 some years. Of <laughs> yeah. in... are, you, are you still working with patients yourself? Oh no, I, I actually never had patients. When I opened the wellness center, we called them clients and we didn't treat, right, right. diagnose or prescribe. And that only lasted five years. I couldn't make it go economically. Um, yeah, no. People wouldn't pay, they'd pay for preventive maintenance on their cars, but not for themselves. And of course, right, right, exactly. so I went into um, working with helping professionals and then infant wellness. And- uh, Oh yes, I remember that now, yeah. Yeah, and now uh, a lot of work with um, um, the um, phenomenon of having children in a nuclear family destroys most relationships and how to prevent that. And uh, also this, this project of recording the oral history of all the names and people that have done stuff through in both adult wellness and infant wellness. And my latest interest is in the whole uh, Vaccine religion that has been promulgated by uh, the CDC and yeah, I, I I agree with that. I people ask me if I'm an anti-vaxxer, and I say I'm not against the concept of the physiological concept of vaccination. I'm uh, I'm against toxic vaccines that are full of adjuvants and preservatives. I'm against vaccines that are created through animal cultures, at least cultures yeah. of cells that carry uh, genetic material from different uh, species and can possibly even carry uh, retroviruses. Uh, I'm against uh, over bombarding young people with vaccinations uh, close together. It, it's basically any good academic immunologist worth their salt will tell you that is going to cause all of those factors are going to cause severe immune dysregulation, which is what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing, yeah. And, 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 and including autism, and I'm sorry that uh, the politics were able to destroy Wakefield, but he was right. Yeah. He may not have been exactly right on the mechanisms, but he was right about vaccines uh, causing these problems. And we're, so we're, that's why we're seeing a massive eruption of Allergies and autoimmune diseases yeah. in people, and um, it's um, it's a travesty. But you know what? It's uh, it's politics and money. If all the money, big pharma yep. is in control. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, working practically full time on trying to explode some of these myths, and uh, that's great. I'll let you know when I, I have a simple tool because right now it's too complicated for people that are vaccine hesitant to get right. the information. It's overwhelming and right. we need a simple uh, way to get their foot in the door. So you know Sherry Tenpenny? I don't know her personally, but uh, she's no. on my list. Yeah. I'm trying to, an old patient of mine uh, for years and her son who's autistic and has ADD. Um, and she's been trying to get an exemption from him for, uh, he's about ready to enter college at uh, Loyola Marymount. And he's a great kid. Uh, and she's never allowed him to have a vaccine. She had a 
couple of terrible reactions to medications when he was a baby, including vitamin K shots, rather the binders and preservatives. But he, um, she can't get an, an exemption. The only vaccine that they that they require for this to enter this university is MMR. It's a live vaccine, and she has three relatives in two generations that are immune compromised, wow. forms of immuno uh, deficiency, and we've documented it. And they keep refusing to do this, and so we're she may have to. We're going to try one more appeal with with science with a letter um, to the school physician who makes the decision. And if that doesn't work, she's thinking about a lawsuit, and we're thinking about who would who, with credible credentials uh, would be able to testify. And she came up with I came up with Sherry Tenpenny's name. I don't know Sherry. I've met her. But I don't know if she would be willing to do that. I don't. I know Joe Kennedy. Um, Joe Kennedy Jr. will won't do it. Well, he's up to his ears with other lawsuits. Like I think they're suing UC Cal. Uh, yeah. For uh, requiring flu shots and. I know. Uh, Mary uh, Holland is on his staff, but uh, yeah, it's it's a huge problem, and they're they're like too afraid to admit they're wrong because of the consequences. They're backed in a corner. Well, it's also, they're getting so much pressure from, I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Trillion, yeah. Trillion, the vaccine, the money that farmers pharma, making on vaccines is tremendous. And the more that they require it, I just got a thing from the Marin County uh, Director of Public Health, what's her name, saying that she's re requiring all hospital personnel, uh, all clinic personnel at every medical facility mandated to have flu vaccine vaccinations. Crazy. And I'm not going to have one. Hmm. I've never had one. I'm not going to have a, a COVID vaccine either if it comes out. Yeah. But you know, uh, big money and political power is pretty hard to beat. Hopefully this, this thing's going to backfire and, and maybe uh, gotten so ridiculous that more and more people, there were huge rallies in Europe uh, the last couple of days that, uh, Is that right? they're waking up. Uh, Kennedy flew over and spoke in Berlin. Um, I saw his speech last night and uh, uh, he was portrayed in some of the American media as going over to talk to a few thousand Nazis, which he said in the speech. Ridiculous. I, you know, it's just unbelievable. It's like, uh, yeah, it's in the Trump administration just is, is falling right. Uh, even though Trump claims he's more of a libertarian, he's, he's tied right into the whole. Well, he's definitely corporate America, yeah. yeah corporate America. Well, well uh, you know, I think it, it won't be our generation that fixes that problem. I don't think I'll be around uh, to see that happen. I, I don't yeah. know. I'm hoping I might make it to to see the beginnings of it unraveling. We'll, we'll see. Well, if, if 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 we see a regime change in Washington um, in November, it might be a and, and, and the more radical um, progressive Dems that um, are clearly also in, into personal uh, civil liberties. Most of them are clueless about the vaccine myth, though, and they buy the vaccine religion. That's scary. It's the That's, Trump people uh, are more aware that the vaccines that are that is true. That is just, ironically that is true. I don't know which. I don't know how you can convince these people I, because they've done such a great job of, of uh, propaganda. Of, uh, propaganda of uh, delegitimizing guys like like uh, Wakefield. Um, yeah. And destroying them, and Nikovits, and all these other people that are good, we're good scientists. I think uh, that that uh, it's starting to come out, and they can only hide it so long. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. It's probably going to take a lot of tragedy. A lot of people are going to have severe consequences of over vaccination, um, yeah. and um, we're going to lose a lot of uh, 
lot of, we see a lot of people disabled and worse before it's uh, before it's changed. But well, Jeff, it's been great, and uh, it's been great, John. It's thank been you fun. for sharing. And uh, I'm going to end the recording now. And uh,